Hello and welcome to Tech of the Month in association with Garmin. This is the show where we bring you the last four weeks in tech and reviews. This month there is the opportunity to win another Garmin Edge 830. We will have a competition, do keep watching to find out how you can enter to win. So kicking things off, we have a couple of headline news items. We had a lot of conversations this month with the UCI, and one of those was around metabolic sensors. The UCI made some changes to its regulations, which meant that metabolic sensors were no longer allowed in competition. That's particularly inconvenient for the brand Super Sapiens, who create a metabolic sensor that tracks glucose for riders. And we know an awful lot of riders are using that. Ineos use it, and also Canyon SRAM riders. Uh, and many riders saying they find it incredibly useful. So when I spoke to the UCI, they gave us very many reasons for why they had banned it. One of them was that they said it would make racing a bit like Formula One with everything tracked and monitored. And they also said that they were worried about data being passed between teams when riders left a team to join another. Uh, and they also said that they felt it could be unfair from an economic point of view because these sensors aren't cheap and some younger riders might not be able to afford them, which could create some inequalities. Uh, then I spoke to Super Sapiens themselves uh, and they were obviously not particularly happy about this ban. They say they'll work with the UCI to do everything they can to overturn it. Uh, and they very much said that they've, they've spoken to, um, to riders, to medics, uh, who are all deeply upset um, because they say that actually these things make racing safer. You know, if a rider bonks in a race, it, it does affect their mental capacity, can actually cause crashes. They've had riders sent to hospital and they found that they, they are actually um, low on glucose. So they do need to carb up a bit more and, and that has potentially resulted in, in a, a crash in a race, which is something no one wants to see. So, I mean, what do you guys think? Do you, should they have been banned? I think to me it seems a little bit uh, sort of like reactionary, almost like a knee-jerk knee response. Um, like similar arguments, I think, have been said about power meters in the past, that they're going to make racing. Um, yeah, so Formula A, people are just going to be staring at their numbers, and I don't think that that's really uh, um, yeah, come to be. I think that, um, yeah, the racing is uh, yeah, just as attacking, even with the power meters, with that data. And, uh, yeah, I don't see how having um, knowledge of your glucose is going to um, yeah, stop um, that attacking um, sort of during uh, races so much. It's a bit like closing the door after the horse is bolted, Really, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, you've got power meters, you've got everything, everything being tracked. Race radios was another thing. So, um, you know, why suddenly no to this? You know, it's a, it's, it's a bit late to be doing this kind of thing. So they're talking about inequality because amateur riders might not be able to afford them. Um, how much do, does a sensor cost, and how often do you have to spend money on it? So the sensors cost, depending on how many you purchase, anywhere between 65 to 80 euros. And over time, you have to wear this thing at all times. So those um, costs will mount up each one lasts 14 days. Uh, it's um, not long, is it, really? Yeah, exactly. It's even less time yeah. if you take into account you're now no longer allowed to wear them for races, so you're going to have to remove it and then put in a new one yeah. every time you race, so yeah. the cost will ramp up. So the founder, Phil Sutherland, has actually written to all the teams that he could, able to, could get in contact with and said he, they will sponsor all of the athletes uh, in order to use them in their training. They're not going to be able to use it in their racing. So this month we learned that Shimano's factory in Malaysia had to close due to a government issued mandate uh, with the Covid situation there. And subsequently we found out that uh, the measures have been extended until the 28th of June. And so that's at least going to be 18 days in Malaysia where no components are going to be uh, manufactured in Shimano's factory there. Which could potentially worsen the supply chain issues that have been hitting the cycling industry for the last series of months. Do we think it's going to affect the launch of Durace? Um, I wouldn't think so, because in uh, the Malaysia factory, that is uh, where Shimano tends to manufacture its uh, lower end components. And so uh, Durace at the top of the tree, um, that's uh, manufactured in uh, Shimano's uh, sort of Japanese facilities. And so for Durace, I don't think that um, yeah, it's going to be um, causing a problem there. But um, yeah, in a way, it's almost going to be uh, impacting uh, more people, uh, the Malaysia factory closure, as yeah, Shimano sells more of a lower tier uh, group set. So, um, yeah, um, might not be yeah, affecting the um, Jury's launch, but yeah, a lot of people I think do stand to be affected by it. And it is the lower ends where you know bike shops have just sold out, and and also you've got people bringing bikes out of sheds that have been relegated there for some time, and they are going to be wearing the lower end components, aren't they? Um, so I can see it being quite a serious issue. Yeah, I mean we're hearing reports that people bike shops can't even get a hold of chains, things like that. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's not going to have too much of an impact. 
So into a couple more in-depth looks at a few of the products that we're looking at at the moment. Stefan is testing this classified hub. Uh, Stefan, tell us a little bit about it and why it's so exciting. Okay, well, you can't really see from uh, right here, but um, yeah, at the back, um, there's yeah, this hub. Uh, it's internally geared, it's got two speeds, and what it's essentially doing is um, replacing uh, the chain rings that um, yeah, you would um, normally have, the uh, steps between those two gears in the hub, and has a number of um, benefits. First is, it um, got to be the speed of the shifting, and so when you're shifting between the chain rings, it does take um, quite a while for the chain to hop onto that big chain ring and also um, drop down, and, and, and also you do have to um, back off the power like a little bit like if you're trying to like hammer a shift um, on the front um, yeah it's just not going to go well you're going to um, drop the train if you're yeah, going down into the smaller sprocket and with this design with the um, shifting happening in the hub classified say that um, you can uh, be putting out up to a thousand watts and still manage to do a shift uh, which is yeah really quite impressive and um, yeah riding around I've been yeah doing my best to um, like try and catch it out and uh, shifting uh, from the uh, from the small gear um, to the large um, uh, gear inside the um, rear hub it's absolutely a flawless fit it doesn't miss a beat like, no matter how hard you're hammering like you can yeah shift from the small gear into the um, big gear i find that yeah, shifting from the big gear into the small gear like it's almost like something's being sort of like released almost uh, within the hub you, you've got that little bit of a feeling the um hub itself it yeah the shift um, does happen there's yeah nothing wrong with the hub but you um, have like almost like a tiny bit of a, like a stutter um when you're um, doing that shifting but that i have to say is um, when you're like putting out a more power than you would ever uh, put out when trying to shift up the rear and so like in in these extreme cases like yeah i have to say that um yeah they have done really well there like you can shift um under load in this way and the shifts like red are just instant and i mean in this setup it's all operated by this little button here which looks a little bit like the blip button you'd get in some setups uh, it's a little strange because you've got a lever here and a button here. How does that feel? Yeah, I would say that um, yeah, the button is uh, maybe like a little bit of a sort of like limitation of the system. I mean, the setup where it is um, is actually like really well placed. You can access it um, when you're on the hood. You can access it from the drops. Um, yeah, that, that's all fine. Um, I, I would want something that's um, a little bit more tactile, um, something that's like integrated into a lever a little bit more. That yeah would feel a little bit nicer than having like the um, sprint shifter and having to use that um, for the shift but um, yeah but that said that's not really sort of our criticism so much of like the hub but as it is um, yeah the button um, it, it it does work and is yeah perfectly functional um, yeah no matter like what position you are in on the bars does, does it have a battery in the hub um, the way in um, which it works is that uh, the through axle um, has like a wireless transmitter and that's how it's um, yeah, communicating with the shifter and um, yeah there is a, a battery in there and so um, that will um, yeah have to be replaced um, incrementally but um, yeah it's not something that you would have to be um, changing uh, particularly often well, what about weight does it add much weight I mean compared to a, um, a, a double chain ring setup and so the weight is um, uh, maybe a little bit of a touchy um, subject um, classified quite coy about um, giving the actual weight of the hub itself and you would expect Expect that um, the hub does weigh significantly more than a standard hub because it's got the shifting internals in there but then that's caveated um, by the fact that you know you don't have the front mech you don't have the inner chain ring you don't have the cables and you don't have the shifting gubbins in the um, left shifter and so yeah you, there's quite a lot of weight savings elsewhere but um, obviously um, the hub itself is going to be a little bit heavier. Is that the future of shifting do we think? Yeah, for me, I think that, um, well, the question uh, has to come into sort of like value and the cost, but um, based on um, yeah, the, purely the mechanics, I think that is uh, so much better than a normal chaining setup. There are maybe like um, a couple of um, caveats that yeah, you might want to um, consider. And so, well, there is going to be uh, some drag, um, some like efficiency loss when you are in the small gear, um, classified say that it's 99%. And when you are in the big chain ring, uh, the drive is direct, and so there's, yeah, there's no loss in the system there. So with a normal um, uh, setup with uh, yeah, two chain rings, uh, you could arguably have a straighter chain line uh, more of the time. When you're in the smallest sprockets on the back and the um, big chain ring, so your largest gears, uh, the chain is going to be that much straighter. If you're in the 11 tooth sprocket um, with um, this uh, chain ring sort of like centered in the middle, like the um, chain line is going to be a little bit more extreme. And then um, conversely, when you're going down the other side of the cassette, 
Um, like, yeah, that's also going to be a little bit more extreme than being like in the small and the small. Like that chain line is quite straight. But then you have to think about like the real world um, usage. And so with this, like you can't go as far wrong as you can go with a two chain ring setup. But when you are like in big and big, like the chain is at a really extreme angle um, there. Whereas, um, yeah, you don't have that with this. And so I think that um, when it comes to um, how people like tend to actually use um, the drive trains, the chain line is going to be better um, with this system, even if you have the potential to perfectly manage things and with a normal setup um, to be optimal and probably yeah b because it's so easy to shift bet or between the, the chain rings uh, or the the virtual chain rings you're probably going to be encouraged to, sh to, to change them a bit more and so cross the chain a bit less oh no exactly I and mean, yeah that's exactly my experience um, yeah, riding around with this mm. and how does it compare in terms of cost how much does it actually cost for the hub and would it cost me less as an overall system I think the cost um, like might limit the appeal of this system. I think that mechanically, I think it's great. I would choose this over a traditional two by system, um, but the cost means that, uh, yeah, if it was uh, my money, I'm choosing um, what to put on my own bikes. I probably wouldn't go for this system to get the, um, uh, the wheel set and um, the shifter. Um, it's uh, 2,399 euros. It is a significant investment and to um, get a full build, um, you can get um, bikes from Ridley and Rose um, yeah, between um, 5,000 euros and uh, just over 6,000 euros. Euros. And so, yeah, it is a very expensive system uh, right now. But um, at the same time, like, yeah, it's only um, kind of just been developed, uh, whereas the Trailia systems have been refined for um, decades um, at this point. And so I can imagine that the price will come down over time. Right now, um, yeah, it is quite exclusive and hard to justify over um, like something like 105. I mean, you are getting a, a, an upgrade carbon set of wheels within that, and they usually are. are a fairly reasonable price is around 999 at the moment, so one grand. So you can almost remove that from the cost to, to an extent. Yeah, yeah um, that, that's very true. And um, yeah, and the um, wheels, um, you can get um, rims up to like a 50 millimeter depth. And so it's, yeah, it's not bad at all. Um, though like one caveat is that you would have to replace the crank set. And that's kind of like, yeah, a cost that you would have to be paying on top, which you're not um, yeah, paying classified. So rather than bringing a product this month, I have brought a conversation piece that we can all thrash out. Um, I published a story during the month and it garnered a fair amount of interest online, so we thought we'd find out what our YouTube audience thinks as well. I, I said it wasn't a rant, but let's be honest, it was, it was a rant. And I wrote it after an ill-fated evening out on the bike and it was ill-fated because of tubeless tyres I was running. Now, I would have overlooked this, this event had it been the only event that had happened this year but it wasn't actually it was the fourth tubeless puncture that I'd had so far in the year that had failed to seal um, and I don't think I'm alone in this now I've had good experiences with tubeless tires before I spent an entire winter on GP 5000 so I'm not in any way fully against tubeless tires they're excellent on gravel bikes they're excellent on mountain bikes um, certainly not of the the breed of cyclists that's saying we should be sort of uh, tentatively riding around on 21 millimeter tires forever more however uh, when a tubeless tire does fail to seal it's is quite infuriating um, and it led to the question of well is is the technology where it should be based on the fact we've now got lots of wheel sets coming out that are tubeless only uh, and we're really limiting riders to a point. We've got rims coming out that hookless fully just to support this tubeless technology. I'm not 100% sure that the requirements of road cycling are fully ready for tubeless. The reason being that we run our tyres at much higher pressures uh, and the sealant doesn't necessarily seal at those higher pressures. So is there a problem with the sealant? Does that need to be fixed? I know that some brands are working on it. Um, am I completely wrong? Should, is, is, it, is it perfect and there's no problems? Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, it's quite difficult um, with um, uh, tyres um, sometimes. Like, there's almost like a counterfactual. Like, um, if you uh, run over like a nail, it's like, um, yeah, any tyre would puncture um, if yeah, you run over that. And, and so it can be like, uh, quite hard to sort of like judge um, wh when you get a puncture, um, whether that is um, like a problem uh, with a particular tyre or whether like any tyre would have like failed at that instance. Like, you know, that particular piece of flint would have um, punctured any tyre. Um, like, uh, you might um, say that, um, yeah, with these um, tubeless tyres, like at least you, um, uh, have the chance 
a bit um, sealing. And if you um, yeah, were running like a clincher tire, then um, yeah, you would um, yeah, have definitely have gotten a puncture running over the same thing. But um, then I suppose when uh, with a clincher tire, like um, yeah, replacing the tube, it's um, an easier um, process than uh, yeah, having to um, yeah, repair, fix a tubeless tire sometimes. Yeah, I mean, you do have um, the like sort of worms and plugs. They can be really useful. But again, at the kind of pressures that road cyclists are, are riding, sometimes they just pop straight out and, and don't work. Do, do you think the sealant maybe needs some, some kind of rating? I mean, there is, there is not such a thing at the moment, is there? Because obviously it depends on the size of the hole as well. I mean, a sealant might plug a very small hole, even if the pressure is a little bit higher than on a mountain bike or something like that. But um, you've got no idea how well a sealant is or isn't going to work with, with a tubeless tyre. That's really the problem, I think. Yeah, you're right. There is no rating system. And this is never a problem. I've never had this problem with gravel bikes or mountain bikes. They always just seal and, and on you go and you don't never even know that you, you had a puncture. And I know that there are brands out there that are specifically working on sealant that will work at higher pressures and that they wouldn't be doing this if this wasn't a problem that was, that was affecting cyclists. It just feels that the industry is moving more and more towards tubeless, yet not 100% sure that people are adopting it and possibly for these reasons. Because ah, like um, at the end of the day, you have to think about like, you know, it is like a little bit of a fast setting up a tubeless system, like, uh, you know, um, having a pump with a reservoir so you can get that blast of air and um, yeah, and they sort of have a tougher bead of getting it on and off. And like, um, these are kind of like uh, sacrifices um, almost. Uh, willing to make them when it's a gravel bike and the system does work so well but if you're going to be getting uh, punctures at like a uh, similar frequency to running inner tubes it's like why not uh, just run inner tubes exactly I, we, like, I fully adopted it I was quite happy um, after that winter spent on GP 5000s had no problems but just this last year's worth of experiences has, has not really lent me towards um, towards particularly seeing that tubeless at the moment is actually an easier option do we think there's like a, um, a, a minimum width of tire that, that that you should look for before you run tubeless something like that i mean i think 28 30, is borderline yeah, but really? um yeah i mean i've had bad experiences yeah. 28 so really sort of a 30 to 32 yeah. to me seems at that point you're probably not going to have problems and and you may be able to ride 25s and 28s and and have a good experience but it just feels that you have a good experience until it goes wrong at which point it's it's a significantly worse experience than if you had just been running a clincher and just swapped the tube On to our Garmin competition. Now, remember we mentioned at the start, we have the opportunity to win a Garmin Edge 830. It is worth 350 pounds and comes with turn by turn navigation and the ability to recalculate routes if you decide to take a detour. It has a market leading touch screen and also comes with performance analytics to help you get fitter and faster. If you'd like to enter the competition, just click the link that is in this video description, fill out the form there. That will stay live for three weeks after the publication of this video, and then we will pick a winner at random. And if you don't win this month, don't worry, because we will have another one to give away next month and every month after that for the remainder of the year. Good luck. Uh, one member of our audience will be rolling along with a brand new Garmin Edge 830 very soon. And another major story from the last month is the brand new Pinarello Dogma F. So Simon Smythe, you have had the pleasure of riding this yeah. bike. Tell yeah. us all about it. Okay. Pinarello just decided it's going to be an F from now on. It's not going to turn into a G. It's sticking with F. And everybody thought it was going to be called an F14, actually. So that, that's one little bit of a surprise for everybody. But I guess the rest of the bike is not really all that much of a surprise because it still looks very much like a Dogma. On the fork, it still has the sort of aero look which uh, Pinarello have gone for with the Dogma since the F8. As for the weight, there's no change there either, actually. The, the frame itself has this target weight that Pinarello, that Fausto Pinarello himself always goes for, which is 850 grams. That's in the size 53. So that frame is the same weight, but what they have done is shaved off a little bit of weight by lightening other components. There's a new uh, Talon Most Ultra Fast handlebar, which is 40 grams lighter. The saddle clamp is lighter as well, and that's something that they're actually really proud of because it's 3D printed 
titanium. Um, and uh, normally that's used for prototyping, but this time it's going to be for production. All of it's going to be 3D printed. It's a shame we can't really see it there, but it is quite a beautiful little thing, little sort of metal lattices in it that are making it lighter. Mm -hmm. And Pillarello are choosing to keep that frame weight um, quite static. And there's lots of brands making disc brake frames quite a lot lighter now, but they, they say that they're not comfortable going lighter. Yeah, Fausto Pinarello has really decided that there's probably no good reason to make the frame itself lighter as it rides pretty nicely, um, traditionally has had, had this, this lovely ride quality. And now that the, the components themselves have shaved off a little bit of weight, 265 grams to be precise, off the frame kit weight, and that puts it exactly on the UCI weight limit of 6.8 kilos, then th there's no reason to, to lighten the frame anymore. Mm. I remember speaking to Dimitrios Katsanis, who's, who's worked on some of the design. He, he, was, uh, he said that Fausto was so proud that he'd far, far surpassed the ISO standards um, for toughness, to which Katsanis said, but I mean, now it's heavier. Um, and, and Fausto said, yeah, but I can sleep at night. Um, so I, I can understand that, um, that, that desire to, to keep the, the weight the same. I mean, this is a disc brake frame, but the other thing they are maintaining is that they will still offer a rim option. Yeah, there is still a rim brake bike, and Ineos are going to be riding that rim brake bike at, at least until the end of the season. This is what we've been told. And, and that's a pretty interesting thing to do there because most uh, or a lot of, of other top bike brands have really stopped producing a rim brake bike, a rim brake version of their top bike altogether. Uh, so I think there have been um, some changes to the uh, sort of detailing of the frame, sort of around the bottom bracket, it now steps up. There has something changed with the uh, seat stays as well. And uh, Yeah, so the, the down tube has been redesigned and uh, it's, it's got this little cutout for the bottle which is aimed at improving the aerodynamics a little bit and it really is only a little bit because the previous dogma, the F12, was, was pretty efficient and going right back to the F8, which was designed by Dimitris Katsanis, uh, that, was, that was very aerodynamic too. So now we're talking about just a couple of watts um, that they've managed to save and that's one of the, the ways that they've done it is by stepping the down tube there so that the airflow kind of goes around the bottle from, from the fork crown and, and flows downwards. The seat stays as well are a little bit lower on the disc brake version here. Um, the, the, the rim brake is actually, you know, obviously it's a completely different bike. It has a different fork and the seat stays meet the seat tube a little bit higher up. But for the first time, Pinarello say that the, the, disc, the disc bike is faster than the rim bike. So last time the F12, you know, the rim, the rim braking F12 was faster than the disc brake one. Now the, the disc brake F is faster. And with each inter iteration, they just, they make very minor changes, don't they? It seems that, um, you never see a complete overhaul or redesign of the dogma, just, just those little minor tweaks. Yeah, it, it still is, is very obviously a dogma, isn't it? And you'd have to know dogmas pretty well to, to really spot the differences. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess I could point a few out. I mean, uh, one is that it's got a little nose cone now, whereas the F12 was, was quite flat. The seat tube it's, itself and, and the seat post are a bit more aerodynamic than before. The, the seat tube is actually only 20 millimeters wide at the top so it's really gone it, it really tapers and it's very narrow and the, the seat post itself is like really razor thin so that, that that's a, a couple of other things there and no changes really to the geometry i assume ah uh, yeah the geometry is exactly the same yeah they've, they've they've settled on this geometry which works and which everybody agrees works and they're not going to mess with it and and that's that that's a good thing so the geometry is the same as before but there are 11 and there are 11 sizes now compared to 13 with the f12 which is still a huge amount. It's probably twice as many sizes as you get with most other top-end race bikes. Producing that many sizes is, is obviously going to be pretty expensive for Pinarello, but they make it back in the, in the retail price of the actual bike itself, which is, which is pretty high. So that was Tech of the Month for July. I hope you enjoyed this month's edition. We'll see you again next month. If you did enjoy it, hit like, uh, let us know what you thought in the comments, and please do hit subscribe if you want to see more of our videos.